Hello, my name is Aaron Sefcik and welcome back to another episode of Fret Buzz the Podcast. Today we get into part two of the reunion with Sean Rogers, all about the drums. A quick thank you to all of those who joined us on our last live YouTube song critique. We had a really good time. If you haven't gotten your submissions in, you have up until the end of April. Head on over to Fret Buzz the Podcast and click on the submit button and yeah, send us your song and we can give feedback, critique on your songs. If you're interested, head on over to Fret Buzz the Podcast YouTube channel and check out the month of March. It was a good time, and yeah, we'll be doing the next one on May 3rd. So if you haven't already, start on those new songs and get them submitted by the end of the month. The more people that uh, participate, the better. So without further ado, let's jump into part two with Sean Rogers, the awesome reunion of the Kairos Quintet. Um, Yeah, thank you again, and here's part two on Fret Buzz, the podcast. Can we jump over to uh, to your music schooling some more? I yeah. Love, I love talking about the differences between music programs, and we've had on at least two guests that were Berkeley. Cole Holland and Miles Harshman both were Berkeley grads. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I've talked about George Mason, um, where I studied, and we... Last week we had Sean Purcell, Dr. Sean Purcell on, who's a jazz professor at George Mason, and he talked about the program. In the future, we're actually going to have the dean of uh, the Jazz Mason program on the show. That's awesome. Uh, Dr. Darden Purcell. So I'm really interested to hear more about Maryland's music, the University of Maryland's music program, and kind of the ins and outs. And, you know, you can yeah. be honest, things that you thought were particularly good about that program maybe some things that weren't so good yeah um i mean my take on music school were there were so i knew i wanted to do music and be music teacher Mm -hmm. so like in that regard when you say interest music and then whatever like your sats blast out to everybody so you start getting those recruiting letters from everywhere so like manhattan school music sends you something like hey you should come audition here and i was like i don't want to perform really though so i knew i wanted to go to like a big college college and i was more or less choosing the school before the music program i just got lucky the maryland's program is really good because maryland was the school i wanted to go to okay also an added benefit was that they did not require music ed majors to do marching band because i had never marched i ran cross country i didn't do marching band right. and uh, like indiana university in bloomington i was like hey i've never marched I will probably bring your program down <laughs> to do like orchestra instead, like further orchestra things. Like what are, what are the music ed majors who are strings people do? Can I like go on that path? And they're like, no, there's two years of marching band required. And then at Maryland, I was like, what's the deal with marching band? They go, music school is crazy enough. We're not rec- 3%. I think of the music school students are in the marching band because it, you're so busy already. Like we're not going to make you do that. That's crazy. Right. So I was like, hey, I like this place already. <laughs> and I gelled with the teacher. Um, I mean, Maryland also feeds the people who teach there are instrumentalists in the National Symphony. It's a top orchestra. So you get like you get an incredible teacher as your studio person. Like when I got there, it was the the principal timpanist and the principal percussionist of the NSO were the ones who head up the Maryland music department or the Maryland percussion department. So you're getting years of experience. Um, I mean, the guy, the reason, the person I like the most there, he'd been playing in the NSO for like 45 years, percussion. So he had, for anything, tricks. There's a an excerpt, Scheherazade is a specific snare drum thing. You're supposed to play like a roll very quietly. And it's extremely difficult to do well. And he does it with one hand. He just goes like brrr, and like drags the stick across the snare and it works. And I saw him do that once. So I tried it. And then they thought that was cheeky when I did that in on like in an audition for parts. I'm like, all right, Shahrazad. And I did that. And you could see the other teachers looking at him like, hey, that's your move. And then, hey, do you copy Tony's move? And I went, I 100% did. <laughs> Why? And I was like, because here's what it sounds like otherwise. 
But, oh yeah, no good call copying his move. Um, I mean the facilities, the Cleary Smith Performing Arts Center is is breathtaking. It's stunning. If you've been there, there's seven concert halls, I think, seven different halls. Um, big, big space for music, arts, uh, dance, theater. So I can speak to, I guess, education path. So I went to like a, a public school, uh, like a university, I guess, not like a conservatory. So Maryland tried to do like a conservatory style like your classes for music were very conservatory as very small, whatever. But I also had like an English requirement I had to get or a science requirement. So I was taking 200 person lectures as well, which is good. Cause like, I didn't want to spend all day in the music building. I already was spending most of the day, but like I wanted to feel like a normal college kid and like walk the campus to a building where I would take a class and then go like get lunch somewhere. Right. So it offered all that has has a football team basketball team like i wanted i i wanted to i picked the place where i was going to have the most fun getting my degree without necessarily factoring in which school would be the like the best one i still think maryland i could have gone to indiana maryland or penn state maryland was my top choice um indiana might have been a better program but i don't I didn't like the marching band requirement. I really did not vibe very well with the percussion people there during the audition. Just, I didn't like their attitude, <laughs> which is really cocky for a kid who was 17 at the time to say, but they were very, they kept going like, we're like the Juilliard of public school. And I go, that's fine. But you do keep saying of public schools at the end of that, like keep yourself in check here. I just, it was, it was like a, a level of pretentious that I didn't need. And then Maryland, he, the guy was, I walk in one day and the, the guy who did the one handed thing, the person, old, old guy, doesn't care attitude. I mean, he cares, but you know, that old man, like, I don't give a boop attitude. Yeah. So I walk in and he's got like a cup of coffee on the timpani heads. And I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> and his feet are up on them. And I'm like, what are you doing? And he goes, ah, the department doesn't give us money. So I figure if I ruin one of these heads, they buy new ones makes sense <laughs> yeah i mean it was hard to argue that logic but like that kind of attitude just like he was more laid back and he he took what he did seriously and like that was obvious but he wasn't like he he could still be fun like that was like it wasn't the thing the audition at indiana they said like hey can you play this one passage again and i said yeah and they said can you do that you didn't do that correctly and i was like yeah i did and I remember we went back and forth for a little bit and ultimately I did do it correctly. And I just, something there, I was like, I don't, that immediately miffed me. Cause I was like, this is something that, cause I didn't change it. Like what it was a five stroke rough, but it up and I did it over and over and over again. And I was like, I haven't changed the way I've played this from the first time I played through this. It's a five stroke rough. And they look like, yeah, it is. And that's like, I, I don't like just tell me if it's good or bad. Don't don't be so nitpicky on the college audition. I don't even need the feedback really. You're just writing down to determine if you want me in the program. And like when I auditioned in Maryland, anything I did, and I remember distinctly like hitting if I'm supposed to hit like a chord like A E, I hit like A or like A flat E, whatever, something like tritonal, not correct. So there's something in there that's right, but then there's like a major seventh in a chord, at like for the very ending note. And I went like, Pink. like kind of made a face and looked up, and then the percussion people they're like nodding and smiling, and then like had a laugh, and they're like, "Yeah, so you want that last note back?" And I was like, "Yeah, boop," and I hit it again. They were like, "Yeah, that's that's better. Okay, that's cool." <laughs> but it was like that attitude. It was just it was more relaxed. It wasn't as it wasn't it like was whiplash. Relaxed. Okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, my okay. tempo. I'm pretty sure during that scene he is rushing too. When he's like, "You're not at my tempo," I'm like, "Your tempo is changing." I that was that was my guys. takeaway from Whiplash. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you were when you were studying, was it like intensive? Though I mean, I remember be, feeling like I just didn't have enough hours in the day, like yeah. to get to do all just so many different classes you couldn't excel at everything because there just wasn't enough time like had piano class and had ear training and had your private lessons and you had you know your music ed classes like oh i've got a quiz in 
flute tomorrow. I've got to practice that for 30 minutes. There just was not enough time. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's as intensive as you want to make it. Um, my sophomore year, this will kind of make sense. My sophomore year, I, on top of the orchestra that we had to do. So I was in whatever group I was in, uh, was Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 11 to 1230. That was like my required ensemble. But I was also in either the wind ensemble or the orchestra, most of their concerts. So then that's Tuesday, Thursday, three to six. And then they also put me into like a repertoire orchestra that met Mondays for like three hours. And when it came time for juries, those not in the know, that's where you play music at the end of the semester. It's like your, your final for your performance grade. And we had to write down like, who's your teacher of the three? Like, what are you working on? How much do you practice a week? Whatever. And I wrote down 1.0 hours of practice a week. Man. And they were like, what? <laughs> and I was like, I don't know. I was like, that's counting the lesson I have with, with uh, Lee. <laughs> and they're like, uh, I'm sorry, what? And I was like, well, you have me doing on top of my regular ensemble. You have me doing about 15 hours a week of ensembles for no credit. So I have to go home and do homework then too. And I don't practice if I need to go to bed because I have class in three hours. And then they were kind of like, oh, what about weekends? And I said, I spend enough time in this building during the week. <laughs> and then they were kind of like, I got an A for the for my last that semester because but they were like we'll let you get away with this one hour thing and we'll take you off some stuff but that number needs to be it's supposed to be like three hours a day is like what they want you to do mm -hmm. and that's i mean that's almost not feasible as well because if i'm learning i got to learn how to play the euphonium for a quiz tomorrow the only time i didn't have to practice for like a method course was when i had to take the percussion methods course because that was my first three years of percussion Right, I loved those classes, the 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 instrument, oh, so the method classes. Like, oh, I get to play violin for four or five weeks, and I get to play viola for five weeks, and or whatever. So best classes because we would basically form an ensemble of secondary instruments just in the class mm -hmm. for I think a semester when I was there, and it was something I think that was before. Maybe they're doing it now. They had a secondary instrument ensemble. The like the music ed majors, you could be like. I, I could play euphonium pretty well. I picked it up really quickly. So that's like, I could have sat down and like read some middle school, like euphonium music in a band that way. And that would have been fun. So doing that, like in classes was fun, but there was no like organized ensemble for that, but there used to be. Hmm. So I don't know if they brought that back. They have that at Mason where on Fridays, the, all the music ed students eventually have to take conducting classes. Hmm. And so they actually, conduct all of the music ed students playing secondary instruments yeah that's which was fun. a really cool experience like i had so much fun playing tenor sax in the concert band for a semester because i just yeah. like i was learning how to play saxophone i had my own still have it but i like actually got to be in a band and play something that was at my level mm -hmm. and it was good for so it was good for everyone practicing that instrument and it was good for the conductors to the student conductors to practice to prepare for going out and actually, you know, being a band or that level or choir of conductor. Yeah. Is that like student teaching? When I student taught, um, a student taught at a school in Bethesda, Maryland, very, very affluent, like fantastic school. And it was the orchestra was definitely closer to a college level program than a high school level. Mm -hmm. So it was something like if I just didn't like how something sounded, I've, I remember telling the flutes on some passage. I was just like, I know that you can play that better than you just did. Mm -hmm. And then they did. And then, so like when I was conducting that way, the person comes out to observe me and she's like, just so you know, like whenever you get a job, you're not going to get this job. So there's no way you're going to just be able to say, play that better and expect it to happen. Like you need to know how to make it better. So like conducting the secondary ensembles is good because you get to hear like, Oh man, that's not wait. You got your, your lips are not tight enough to make that note, whatever it is. Yeah. It's useful. Cause if people, if the musicians that you're conducting don't actually fully know how to play the instruments that well, I mean, you mm -hmm. might, you have to have some knowledge, like, you guys are flat. Like you might want to change your mouth, you know, pull your mouthpiece out in order to get in tune. You right. need to have that ear because the kids aren't going to do it on their own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a 
that is a, alternate fingering in order to play this passage yeah. better. That makes a big difference. Yes, yeah, so you have to have some knowledge. And then at least some knowledge like of expression. Like as you get older, I can't do high school. I wouldn't be able to teach like a one-on-one -on -one violin lesson with a high school person. But like in an orchestra setting, I could hear and go, no, we need more of a swell. Like at this point, you can lead that way. And then like, hey, I can tell you it needs to swell. But like how? <laughs> that's, that's, where, that's where your private lessons come in. Right. Yeah. <sighs> So what can we talk about your your physical drums? Yeah. Um so I have two kits now. I used to have like five and that was unnecessary. Um the like my best kit or my my baby is a Gretsch Renown 57. Gretsch drums sound amazing. They're solid maple shells. They're modeled, it's got chevrons on it, modeled after like 57 Chevys. The that's so pretty and sounds great but it's a 22 inch bass drum. It's big. It's a full size kit. Yeah. So I never use it because I play really small stages right. and I have, um, the break beats by Questlove by Ludwig technically is a 16 inch bass drum. So it's like using a floor Tom for a bass drum you put it on a riser so that it hits the normal way. Small Tom, Tom, a small floor Tom, but still the full size 14 inch snare. So you get like a nice full snare sound, which is good instead of like a piccolo that higher pitched. Right. Um, and it's small. <sighs> Man, I could probably, I can set up on a near about half of the size, like half of the space that the other drum set takes. And like yesterday I was playing in essentially like a triangle. Uh, probably about four feet from like the back of the seat to the front of the bass drum total. Wow. It's got a really small footprint. It's really small. Yeah. And then, I mean, so I was crammed there. Like that wasn't particularly comfortable. I'd prefer to spread out, but I can play really small spaces like that. And then th the drums sound pretty good. And if you buy, like they come with stock heads. If you change out the drum heads for like good heads, that alone is going to make even terrible drums sound better. Yeah. Um, but I mean, the shells are sturdy. The shells sound pretty good and you put good heads on it. And that's like, I, I don't use the Gretsch kit because there's never a need. This one sounds great. It's the one we recorded the Cairo stuff with. Yeah. Um, it sounds great and it's small and it's, it's way more practical. Yeah. Like it's, it's, I can throw the whole thing in. I have an SUV. I don't have to fold any seats down. I can put it just in the space behind the back seat, the whole kit. So that's nice. I can drive whatever, like five people and drums to a gig if I need. Yeah, nice and compact. It's got a nice, mm -hmm. nice tight sound. Um, yeah, and it sounds good. Like that's if it sounds as good as it does, there's no reason to use the other one. If there's a stage ever that's appropriate, plus it's like the other drums with the maple shells, like it's just loud. Like they're thick, heavy maple shells and they sound beautiful and they resonate amazingly. But that's, I mean, if you touch it, it's going to be almost twice as loud as that the other kit is, hmm. the breakbeats. Yeah, a lot of the places Sorry. you're playing, you don't, I mean, if you're in a bar or something, like people don't want to not, they want to be able to talk to each other and enjoy the music at the same time. And, it's got to be more fun to be able to play harder on a smaller kit than to play a big That's kit exactly. and have to use hot rods or brushes yeah. or something, you know. Or just playing softer in general. Like, I've played um, the same venue with both kits, and the first time it's like just doing a sound check. I use the same cymbals regardless. Cymbals are cymbals. Mm. Good cymbals are going to be louder. They're going to ring longer. But it's not like, I mean, you. That's however hard you hit it is how hard they're going to sound that doesn't really change the way that the drums do. So like just kind of lightly playing, the drums are still booming because they're huge. They're thick. They got this great sound. And then I take the smaller kit and I play to that same like volume and it was like way too quiet. So, I, Oh good. I get to actually like lay into them. Lift, yeah. Like lift my arms to play. So I would trade that compromise of like, I get, if I get to really hit the drums, I'll play the quieter kit. Ideally, I would love to play the loud kit like when I was in a punk band. It was loud enough. It worked. So I could hit those drums really hard and play the big awesome kit. But if I can't 
like if you can't, it's it's not as fun if you can't play, you know. Right. right. So like if I'm not really laying into it, it's not going to be as fun. Yeah, and with uh, with <laughs> especially with drummers, I mean, I, even with you know all the students that I have in bands and whatnot like that, I always tell the drummer, I said, look, we, even with these soundproof walls, anybody in the lobby can hear within a band mm-hmm. environment they hear the loudest instrument what do you think that is yeah <laughs> it's like the drums the crack of the That's snare why they're behind the shelf yeah it, it, you you they are so their drums are naturally loud they've got that you know resonance to them um, mm-hmm. that on a smaller kit like that when you get to lay into them that that's it's uh it's satisfactory you know you get that yeah Whereas if you have a larger kit, you you as a drummer have to be a very controlled drummer to be able to pull back. And most often going into any kind of venue, uh, the drummer doesn't have that control. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, I've I've even been in bars where, you know, a shield is needed. And it's like, you don't want to go to a bar and be a drummer and be that drummer that that, that has the shield <laughs> it's, want- it's a great kit it's the small kits i think are there's it's like a i don't know if it's new but i feel like there's more and more companies making smaller ones yeah i just saw gretch makes one now and i was like oh yeah but it's three thousand dollars i saw like, um yeah. hard pass yeah. for three thousand dollars for a half size kit yeah. the break beats were 400 yeah and sound oh. fantastic another whatever like hundred dollars in drum heads and stuff and so you spend five six hundred dollars maybe yeah and it sounds there's no way that it sounds whatever twenty four hundred dollars worse than the other kit right right it's just it's a lot like uh amp guitar amps i mean mm-hmm. you can get a pretty good amp for 500 bucks and then like they're like the dumbbells are like mm-hmm. fifty hundred thousand dollars and like yeah, they probably sound a little better. I'm surely they sound amazing, but if you listen to, uh, just get miles to mod yours. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you could get you can get ninety percent of the way there with something at a tenth of the cost. If you, yeah, you know, obviously there's a lot of your technique and your fingers, and but having a, a small amp, you actually get to hit, you get to lay, you get to turn it up. It sounds better. Yeah, like there are very few situations now. I've said this multiple times. You don't need a big amp unless you're no. like really. There's nowhere. I played the no. Vanguard again recently. No. This big venue in Hampton, and like I bring my Fender Princeton amp. It's like 12 watts and has a teeny speaker, and like I'm playing a, a place the size of a basketball stadium. Like. He mm-hmm. puts a he puts a amp mic on my guitar and it comes through the house system. Yeah, I that's all you need. Up, yeah, I get to turn it up to where it sounds like it's supposed to. And I'm sure with drums, I mean, we would talk about that in Kairos too. Like whenever you see like Motley Crue and those giant stacks, there's not those are for show. They have like one amp and then it's going through the house. Yes, that's exactly right. Like, it, when you see like these old pictures of the Who or what? Well, I guess not. Maybe such the Who, but because <laughs> they actually had did it. Wall. Yeah, yeah, they actually did it. But many bands like that, they were had these walls of amps, and it's like yeah. none of those are actually hooked up. You know that, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you see the wall of amps, and then you see like a Fender frontman with a mic in front. Like, oh, that's what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Did you have you seen that video of uh, I think it's Pete Thorne and like some of the guys from that pedal show and Anderson, Anderton's music? They they turn a Marshall full stack up to 10. It's like a JCM, like an 80. No, now I'm gonna it, definitely <laughs> have to. It's really entertaining. Like 10 different players go into this room and just like wail on it it's it's really fun to watch that'd be fun you know everybody's like ears are bleeding afterwards right yeah. <laughs> naturally yeah yeah i mean it's, it's the drums though it's the same the same thing like you can you want to be able to play fully without playing loudly there's a difference between like loud is is a bad word in music like you can play out but like you don't ever want to say oh it's too loud because that oh like supersedes any quality just it's too loud i can't hear even what they're doing 
There was a drummer where um, that I respected that I, that taught actually at Bach to Rock before you guys, um, who had talked to me, and I'd love to hear your perspective on this, Sean, uh, for all our listeners. Um, he had talked about the box and how your shoulders and down and in within this like bo- this range and how your your hands should never really leave that box. Um, in terms of control Uh, i see a lot of drummers where they'll try to approach the guitar or the guitar yeah (laughs) uh, try to approach the drums where they're they're like swinging and they're coming out of that quote-unquote box um what is your experience with control in in that approach I've been taught and untaught so many ways to like play the drums. Um, like when I was growing up just on a snare drum, we, I was originally using a lot of arms and everything. And then my teacher was like, Nope, it's mostly wrist. He's trying to get me like drumline style stuff. Right. And then when that went to college teacher at college was like, no dude, you got to use your arms more. Like this is way too like regimented. You got to be more fluid. If you use your whole arm, you're going to sound less stiff. Um, I mean, there's definitely a box that you don't want to leave and that's just sort of like a natural range of motion, I guess. Right. Um, right. The more movement you use, the more energy you're using, you're going to get. Yeah. Yeah. You get more tired, but also like you need like to play loud or to play fast, whatever. You can't just like concentrate just in wrists. A lot of times you need arms. Right. Now, like, did you watch Travis Barker Blink-182 play? I don't think that level of movement is completely necessary, but it works for him. <laughs> like, right. Right. Right, I, right. I move when I play. And that's, I mean, it's part of it, too. Depending on the venue, like, I move more. Like, I'll feed off the crowd. If it's, like, a super live crowd and they're really into it, like, songs that are louder, I'll be doing a lot more just moving as I play. Yesterday's gig, we were mostly background music. I just kind of sit still i don't need i don't need to move i'm not the music isn't moving me as much right so it's a little bit of both like there's there's you want to have your technique and your control but like i don't know man if you're holding the sticks right and it's working like have fun yeah yeah that's and yeah so it it depends like max weinberg on uh bruce springsteen like he he would be the textbook definition of the box he doesn't move he's very like technical his posture is perfect his arms are perfect but that doesn't look like that much fun to do just to sit and be like right there for three hours like move around some not again no travis barker standing up doing flips or whatever he's doing but like we do 99 red balloons in a band and it's just that riff that tempo is good and the whole time i'm playing my head is going like up and down like crazy because it's just that's a fun riff and i'm mostly just keeping straight time there yeah so my whole body will start moving like i can dance from the waist up because i do that on the drums i can't really i've never really danced standing but like if i'm playing music i will be i'm i'm moving on the kit if it's fun how about um how about the angle of your drums like toms and that's all everybody's it's different strokes for different folks um there's like a pretty sometimes you're limited by what you have like if you have the Bach to rock drum sets so there's the one that's got like that like the yamaha that big rack that's very customizable that huge bar that goes across yep yep like if you're setting up the toms then the toms are mounted to the bass drum yep like you only have so much you can do there and if your drum is 12 inches like you it has to be at least 12 inches sort of like off of the bass drum so it's not hitting it Mm -hmm. so like my smaller drum i can position more or you'll see people who take their top tom tom and they put it on a snare stand right. because they can't position it correctly with the mount on the bass drum. Um, so like you don't want the drums to be whatever like vertical because it won't sound as well. <laughs> right, right. But other than that, I mean, however you play them is fine. A, I, somebody I know plays with the hi hat like almost or I guess the snare almost as high as the hi-hat, like at the same like level. I don't know how you can play that way right hand on top without just constantly hitting your other hand. There's no space. Yeah. Like, 
but it works for him. So fine, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Then I guess like if whatever you're doing, I'll change up my setup depending on how many drums I have. Like my ride cymbal changes position. If I have just a, a high tom and a floor, then I put the ride like in between more like a traditional jazz kind of setup. If I have a another tom there, obviously I'll move the ride more above the floor tom, like off to the right. Just depends on the setup, depends on the gig. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I'll set up a floor tom that's like almost level or a, a, a rack tom that's like almost level with the snare just because I'm supposed to be like compact, whatever, or like low. I'm yeah. playing like a pit in an orchestra. My cymbals will be down low. I'll be down lower just in general so that I'm not like sticking out. But like on a main, and it's been so long since I've like really just set up. Like if I were to set my drums up in my basement now and like really position them exactly how I want, I never do that because it's like we get there, I got to be set up in like an hour mm. or I get there, I get there first. I got to be set up before the rest of the band in a lot of these cases because the stage is so small. Like I'm setting pieces up, taking them up to the stage, putting it together, trying to still tweak it so that I'm comfortable, but also minding like, all right, I got three other instruments coming with amps that have to fit on this stage that can maybe hold one person. So it's, it's a lot of ad adapting, I guess, but you have a general, you you find out eventually just what works for you physically. Like I'm just, I like a 17 inch drumstick. The sticks I use are 17 inches. Um, I picked up, a stick that's 16 inches i didn't think one inch would be that much of a difference it's like it changes how i would play entirely i have to reach a little bit farther i have to do whatever else right um but it's fun i mean the same way if you change like the gauge on your strings for a guitar depending on a gig or whatever or if you're just trying to switch it up see how you feel using like medium gauge instead of medium lights whatever right 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 yeah switch up maybe i want the tom to be higher this time maybe i want the symbol to be farther away maybe i want whatever the hi-hat to be even higher and just kind of that if it's comfortable that day for me it is if it's not comfortable the next day i'll change it yeah what, what are your thoughts on the different types of wood i mean i know you you mentioned that your maple your solid maple gretch kit like it it's very resonant but like yeah. they have birch kits and they have maple kits and all kinds of other stuff and snares. Sometimes there's metal, like copper yeah. and metal snares and stuff. I prefer a wood snare. Um, you can tune uh, metal snares are just, they're like, they're just harder. They're stubborn, I guess. Cause they don't, it echoes differently off of metal than wood. There's a little bit of like absorption just based on the material. So like I found metal snares, if I'm just tuning like for a classroom or something, they're very pingy. They're more finicky to tune correctly. Um, a wood snare, you throw the heads on, and if you have decent snares, decent heads, whatever, you can make it sound pretty good pretty quickly. Um, I mean, the the level of ply, I, I don't remember how many ply maple the, uh, the Gretsch is, but I mean, the drums are probably twice as thick as the uh, break beats, which I think is birch. And that's the thickness is going to add depth and resonance too. Um, I don't know, like with drumsticks, hickory is the best way to go. At least in my opinion, hickory is indestructible. Maple is lighter. I just I've I've been using hickory ones. I used a maple stick that I I liked because it was larger, but it wasn't heavy. Maple's not as heavy of a wood. But then I recorded, and I listened back, and it was one was doing it with the maple and i heard something with the hickory sticks and i was like oh i can there's a there's way more punch with the hickory ones i can hear the drums have way more like oomph to them uh -huh. um what about like on your toms like having and your kick having like a maple versus birch or whatever other wood same same deal i mean maple maple's great there's like i'm trying to think of with like marimbas and stuff rosewood cherry wood sounds beautiful like paduke wood the cheap stuff is not going to sound as good 
I, I don't, I'm sure there's something to like the density of the wood itself in the specific tree. Like some tree, somebody figured out this is going to sound better. Um, that plays into like those million year old, like stra or million year old, the million dollar, like 300 year old Stradivari violins. They were made using whatever technique and whatever wood they can't be replicated. I have no idea. I don't know if I've ever heard one. Maybe I have. I've seen somebody who's been playing one. I couldn't tell the difference between that and like a, I don't know, like a $50,000 violin. And I don't even know if that's expensive or not. But that's like, if you're paying $2 million, like, oh, it sounds exactly like this. Does it? Right. My ear is not good enough to hear whatever that is, a million dollar, million plus dollar difference in sound. But um, going back to a kit, like if you were to play the same size mm -hmm. kit with the same setup and you had mm -hmm. a maple kit versus a Gretsch kit and they had similar ply levels, like is there a yeah. difference maple in sound? More than the birch. But like, uh, it would like, be does one have a warmer? Okay. Yeah, the maple will be a little bit warmer. There's, it's warmer or fuller, that kind of... Yeah, it, it, they sing a little more. Mm. Um, it's almost like describing wine. It's all these, in beer, like these words, yeah. nutty and tannins. <laughs> you can taste the tannins. Like what... But yeah, that's kind of what I'm getting at. Like, what's the vibe is, you get from each... There's a wood. warmth. Like, the maple ones really... They, they resonate. They don't ring but they resonate like you can hear them for a while. And I don't know if you necessarily hear it as much as you feel it as it continues. Um, the birch ones, I think is the cheaper ones that tends to be in a lot of kits. Sounds pretty good. If you have a good drum head, it's going to sound good, but the sound's going to decay a little faster. Okay. Um, that could also be though, how you tune, but I it just, in my experience, I found, the Gretsch maple kit I have, like you hit that, it's gonna. There's gotta be. I'm I'm trying to think of like a guitar difference. If there's a guitar made with a better wood, you can play the the same string, but one's just gonna sound fuller or warmer or brighter, whatever you want. I guess the birch kits are technically a little brighter. I would I describe it as like a sharpness, they just like how they cut, as opposed to being more of like a round. But maybe in the in a like for your snare, you might want that to cut through a little bit better. Mm -hmm. I do crank my snare. Um, I like that. To, for, yeah, for live shows, because then I, I can either hit it harder. I don't necessarily have to, but it will always cut through. You need the bass in the snare more than anything else. Snap. So I'll make sure that the snare is is good and cuts through. And then I have things called the big fat snare drum. It's just a plastic thing you drop down and it turns it like, if I have my snare sounds like it's in the red hot chili peppers, I drop a big fat snare drum on it. Sounds like a Zeppelin snare. Mm, that's cool. So there's little things you can do like that where I don't have to mess too, too much with the drums. Cause now there's little like fun toys you can put on. that can alter the sound that way. Yeah. So like one song, I need a deeper sound. I put that on the next song. I need more of the crack. I take it off. Now I have that. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. It's almost like guitar effects pedals. It's nice to have that yeah. be able to customize to each song. Especially mm -hmm. if you're playing in a cover band and you want to be able to kind of get the vibe of the original yeah, song right. across. Yeah. What are your thoughts on electric kits? So I got, um, I'm going to say I love them because I got one for free. Um, <laughs> free is good. It, yeah. And it's good because I, we live in a townhouse. So, like, the room I have for music is just the third bedroom we're not using. It's a music room. It's like, there's no way I could set up like an actual drum here. Right. I had drums with mesh drum heads that reduce like 95% of the sound. Yeah. And at a place, at an old apartment, I didn't think that was an issue. And then I had some bad neighbors who I guess like I was playing at like six. And that I guess they didn't like that, so they reported it to the office. Really? They gave me a notice, hey, you're too loud. And then the next day, I got another one that's like, we'll evict you if you get a third notice. And I was like, hey, I wasn't even here yesterday. This is just salt. Like, this second one is not founded right. on anything. Wow. And I invited them in, said, here, listen to these drums. Like, this is what I'm doing. And they go, that's not that bad, but we have to tell you to stop because they've filed enough complaints. Electric kit takes away any of the like inherent physical parts that you feel from the drums, the oomph, that like depth. Yeah. 
because you're just hitting like plastic and whatever. Yeah. But then you hear the sounds in the headphones. So they're great for practice, great for small spaces, but it's not the, it's not the same. An electric guitar and an acoustic guitar are not the same, but there's still the feel of playing a guitar. It's a completely different because it's like I mean it's an artificial drum set. I don't I don't know how else to. It's just not this. It, it, I feel like it would be like driving a Prius versus like a Mustang. Right. Like one you're gonna feel and has that like there's there's a literal feeling to it, not just what it sounds like, and then the other one works, but it doesn't have that same. Right. Doesn't do anything for you inside. Not, not, <laughs> <laughs> my experience using an electric kit it was that the biggest thing that really bothered me was the the bounce back. The like your sticks mm -hmm. didn't bounce off the heads the same way that they do on a real. Yeah, they're yeah. way responsive on because the rubberness they'll bounce back yeah. more. Yeah, yeah. There's no give. Yeah, and then they're not as customizable. They're good for like I've tried to set mine up about as close to I would normally play, and I'm it's helping because I'm trying to put like the middle of each drum where the middle would be on an acoustic right. setup, right? But these are way smaller. I mean, they're what like eight inches across, so like if nothing else, it's target practice too. Yeah. So I'm getting better at like hitting the spots of the drum I actually should be hitting, right? Right, right. There's a lot of dead space in between, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, there's there's no forgiveness. If I'm playing something and I miss, like I I won't hear the tom in the headphones. I'll just I will hear silence because I miss the drum entirely, as opposed to like hitting the rim or like sort of getting the head. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever brought your electric kit to a gig? No, I've only had it for about like two weeks. Oh, okay, this is, uh, somebody was just didn't want it and. The saxophone player in one of my bands was like, I feel like my drummer would want it if you're giving it away. And I was like, I would. I would. <laughs> awesome. I will take that. <laughs> it's they're great practice tools, but yeah. for live shows, I've played musicals like in a high school where they have an electric kit. And that's fun because for each song, like I can program, you know, this song should have more of a like a electric sound change that up this song should have more of the acoustic sound switch to like those patches yeah. but i don't i mean it's it's for me it's feel like it's not as it just it just isn't as fun yeah understandable yeah there's a there's a tangibility that there isn't on an electric kit that playing a full plus and i think that comes back to just like how they're loud it's a loud instrument like you don't want to drums are loud they're communicating instruments you can hear them for miles you don't want something that you hit and it goes like right like you want to hit and like feel that power behind it yeah yeah i agree the, the sound wave the acoustics the how it plays with the environment that you're in and yeah mm -hmm. it's just fun yeah there's nothing more fun yeah. You'd be proud of me. I went to a drum circle here in Virginia Beach on last Sunday and it was I had a blast. I mean, I go sometimes, but uh it's playing my djembe and yeah. uh I love doing that, but there's all, you know, other people have different types of drums. Most people have right. djembes at these things, but um I taught a student hand percussion for about a year and a half and he they went on a trip to Greece and he came back with a doomback. Nice. And uh that doomback cuts through um because you know it's got that it's a ceramic body and it's got a like a plastic head it really cuts in in the midst of the drum circle yeah it's really fun to play real instruments too so like i have two djembes i say i have a real one and like a fake one i have a remo mm -hmm. factory made one and then i have one carved by hand out of a tree with an antelope skin head on it yep um, which is, I mean, that's my favorite thing to do. I take back what I said about follow the drinking gourd. I like bringing in my djembe and then the kids are like animal skin. I go, yeah, there's some parts like on the side where I haven't hit it with my hands. So you can still feel a little bit of the fur. It didn't shave mm -hmm. it all the way down. Yeah. I'm like, Oh, that's so weird. But those sound like those, those ones handmade from a single tree carved out of a tree and it's thick. It's a heavy drum. You can hear those like in Africa and planes like two miles away because if there's no like if you're out like out in it 
so here there's buildings and stuff to block it, but you're just out like in planes, they can be heard literally for miles. Yeah. And the Remo ones can be heard, I'm sure, for like yards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had a I had a uh, I can't remember the the name of the brand. It's like a they make drums like regular kids. Toka. Minel? Uh, Toka. It was Minel, yeah. Minel, I had yeah. a Minel one and I uh I had a roommate anyway who was wanted to get one, so I went with this with him to the guitar center to get one. And I found this no name brand that was like, you're talking about a real djembe mm -hmm. carved out of solid wood with animal skin. And I ended up buying that one and selling in mine. <laughs> and like the different, we will still get together sometimes. And like mine sounds so much better. Like, yeah. Those, this, the, does. anything with the metal tuners on the sides, like they just don't, the, uh, what do you call it? the See, lugs whatever man, yeah the lugs and the yeah. man-made heads like they just don't sound as good yeah that's i mean that's like electric kit acoustic kit if, if, or in terms of feel too like when you're playing the the man-made kits or the whatever factory made like drums they're still fun but there's there's nothing like when you switch to like that one that's handmade and you hit it and you can hear immediately like whoa there's something definitely different about this yeah have you ever gotten to play congas? A uh, little bit, mostly just if I'm doing like a musical show or something like that. Djembe was more of my thing. Through high school, like West African hand drumming was one of the things I was like really, really deep into. And yeah. then there weren't as many opportunities in Maryland. They had an African drumming class and I like looked into it and talked to the guy and like showed up with a drum and he saw the drum was like, you're already a, like, if you have this drum, you're already above the level two class and there's only two levels. And I was like, great. So what do I do then? <laughs> and the spots in DC, there's drum circles and stuff, but that's kind of fallen by the wayside as drum set is, I mean, it's needed everywhere. You don't need a djembe player as much for bar gigs as you do a kit player behind electric guitars and stuff yeah i really like the oh, the congas the congas are i mean it's just a completely different technique with the you know yeah. it's a lot more the palm, palm hand palm yeah fingers. i really enjoy Drum that fun, man, because it's it's the physical aspect of it there's nothing as physical to play like play guitar you push a finger down to play a drum you have to raise and lower your arm entirely yeah or wrist but I mean, it's there's the physical element of just using your whole body. Yeah, it's a yeah. workout. Yeah, when you yeah. incorporate the set, then you're getting your like other limbs involved, and that's when p other people like fall off because they're like, Haha, I can get two working, three yeah. not so much, four. It's just no. <laughs> Those are my favorite gigs, though, man. We played last week, and it, it was there was two birthday parties that had the whole upstairs floor of this place reserved like right until we started. Mm. So the place was already like midnight, 1230 crowded at 10 when we started. And I was like, this is going to be awesome because now we don't even have to start quietly. There's bodies that are going to absorb the sound. Right. And the gigs where I'm sweating like profusely by the end are usually the ones where I'm having the most fun because that's you're really, really playing. Yeah. Yeah. For our listeners, um in terms of uh the things that people should be aware of in your experience like i'm just kind of thinking of in terms of like um the members of a band be it a vocalist a pianist a, ba a bassist especially a bassist um and a guitarist um and how like within my experience of you know teaching bands um how from a drummer's perspective what um what they what you would be able to clue them in on things that they would be they should be aware of um things that they may not think about from a drummer's perspective or on the opposite uh, end of that, speaking directly to drummers and what mistakes or what things that they should be aware of, maybe that they're not thinking about in terms of the band environment or whether it's like most band, most drummers don't know chordal structures and mm -hmm. things like that. So that was really where my question was going to be coming from. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, this circles back to where we were saying you just like listening is such an, such an important skill. If you're a bass, I mean, the bass and drums should be able to hear each other all the time. Yeah. They should be married. Yeah. And that's like, it's always cool. Cause you're the, you're the rhythm. You need the, the bass bass still gets to carry some melody but like if you're doing some riff i'm not going to try to do something that goes completely against it because not like you want to compliment right um it's usually rhythmic things like guitars if uh just like in bands i've been in experience wise if they're doing a riff you just like forget how to do the riff and sing so if you're whatever it is, you know, sometimes there's things that just rhythmically you get like you confuse your own head. So you can't do like dun 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 whatever. And the, the, I guess that was what all my life by the Foo Fighters just now. Yeah. But if you whatever, so if you can't sing and do that riff and you just start going dun 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 dun, dun that would be something. If I hear that, I would pick up. And if you're doing that, I would still try to have on the bass drum boop boop boop. Boop, 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 like whatever the underlying rhythm is supposed to be. Yeah. Um, it's listening. If you don't read um, like chord structures or anything, I've done, and like with Cairo stuff, when you come in and it's just measuring, you have like a lead sheet, A, C, whatever. If I can see that there's a chord change, whether or not I should hit a symbol or something, you can at least follow and you can see like how the song moves. Like you don't just sit on one chord the whole time. Right. So you can see things like that. Um, it's, it's really, it's listening. Yeah. It's kind of know, know your, know your place, I guess too. Like, yeah. 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 I, I, it really does come down to listening and all members of the band need to have that open, mm-hmm. open ear and kind of, it's just like you said, it's just like with, with uh it all comes back to kairos which is kind of crazy but just listening to each other and being aware of what everybody's doing and and um yeah it's noodling and practicing that can all happen on your own time and when you're actually in in a band environment together uh that's that's when you're supposed to be listening to each other and having that conversation that's really what it's all about that that conversation between musicians musically um yeah. I feel like this is related. So like, when the bands that I'm in now, mm. one I was in because I was playing guitar at an open mic and the, the husband wife duo. And they were, I was, I would talk and I was like, I'm a drummer by trade. And they were like, Oh, we actually need drums for a gig. That's how that started. Right. Other bands though are Craigslist ads. And I respond to, I search whatever drummer, but I don't, I search like looking for drummer and every time I see the like on Craigslist drummer looking for band, I'm like, then why don't you try to find that band that you want to join? Um, so to a degree, I guess it's kind of like picky because like I would listen to a bunch and I, these two bands I was in one kind of came along because saxophone player works with my wife and Mm. I was looking at both of them at the same time. And I auditioned for the nineties band before this tiny band. And the tiny band came along afterwards because they're like, hey, your husband plays drums, right? We don't like our current drummer because she doesn't want to do any of the songs that we want to do. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, okay. But being able to choose and listen to like, if there's, hey, this is our band, we kind of sound like this, or these are our influences, you can determine if that seems like something you would want to do. Right. So then, like, when I got there, like, when I was auditioning for a group, I was like, oh, I like the music they cover. I like this stuff. Yeah. I like and the vibe that's going on here. Yeah. Yeah. And then, like, and I know these songs, so I can listen. And if they're going to be looking for, like, we do Monkey Wrench. If you're looking for the specific hits, whatever it is, like, if you're looking for that, I know those little nuances, too, right. that I would assume you're expecting to hear. Right. Yeah, I just I know from both sides of the of the of the wall there are drummers who um, don't necessarily listen to the band, um, and then vice versa. There's also a lot of 
band members, be it, like I said, vocalists, pianists, guitarists, bassists, who don't necessarily listen to the drummer. And there is that that wall that goes up and it's all about breaking down that wall and, and listening to each other. Um, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's a, like the, the group, the tiny group, it's, it's, it's our band, but it's like the ukulele, the lead singer, it's like his band. Right. You know what I mean? Like it's not, and I, I mean that in a completely respectful way, he's driven, like he wants, he creates spreadsheets, songs, super organized, Yeah. but like it's his baby. I'm aware of that. And like, he's still, he's super collaborative. We still work together on a, but like everything. Oh, what do you think of this, that, the other, but a lot of times he'll be like, what do you think about doing this song? And mostly I just want to play anyway. So it's something like somebody right. yesterday requested like Sweet Caroline. And he was like, we could learn that. And I was like, no, let's not learn that. <laughs> I, I'm tired of that song. <laughs> right, 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 right. But like, if he really wants to, we will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's fine. That's a, we- It's good though, too, because you need that like leadership. Like he yeah. wants to, if he's going to do that, like that's fine. Because I'm not going to take the lead on the things where he's pushing out and getting gigs, whatever. Yeah. I like to play, help out with the music and stuff, but if like all of the direction is him and that's not a problem at all. Yeah. Kairos was we all went in five just that's five it. equal players. Yep. That's why we played like two gigs. Yeah. We're just there, trying to make music. Yeah. There are some projects obviously that it is one person's mission and so what they want to do in life, be it, you know, um uh I forget who's that I'm not going to use that example because I don't remember who the guy's name is, but nonetheless, uh, there are bands like, uh, you know, obviously like rush, you know, it's three guys and they all have that collaborative feel. And that's why rush is what rush is. But then you have, you know, these single name people out there and it's their vision and it's their band and, and not, I'm going to dictate. How yeah. It goes. So. That's sort of like when you guys were talking about, um, Ooh, which which podcast was it where bands were like if you have the i think you're talking about festivals it was mm-hmm. the festivals where you're talking about like bands with the like a full band versus somebody who picked up musicians with them so like dave matthews band would be a good example because his name is in it but that's the same people that doesn't rotate right versus like if taylor swift is putting together like a stadium tour and she auditions drummers something like that right 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 um but it's i mean it's it's knowing is this more of um is this more of like this person just wants musicians to back him up or does he want bandmates sure, so like, it can get complicated depending on what you're trying to do if you're yeah. trying to record music and make money you may want to just hire people to record the parts right. so that you don't have to deal with all the you know them owning portions of the song and Every time you want to sell sell the rights to it, you gotta get permission yeah. from everybody, and which could you know could be could be complicated, but it's never gonna be the, as good as if you if you let the drummer do his thing and let the bass player do her thing. I mean, it's yeah collaboration will ultimately yeah, make I mean, better music, probably. Yeah, right. And that's I mean, it's it's good. Like the tiny band, I I really I just want to like I. I hope none of that came across as negative, but it's not like it's his band. He's the clear leader, but we are all band mates. Like it's not like our opinions all matter. Well, you know, you can't do it without you. That's for sure. Yeah. There's clearly a designated, like we're aware that there's somebody who's like the leader and we're there to help him, but we are also like, it's a team. Yep. Yeah. Whatever. He's the captain of the team, but it's not like he's, I don't know coach and we're all the players and he's making us do whatever it's like if he's the team captain like we're all in it together but we have we are aware that there is a leader here yeah it seems to naturally happen in most situations mm-hmm. yeah I and mean, even i just i played in a couple gigs with this jazz quartet recently and like it does it just naturally some people are a little bit louder and have a clear vision even if they weren't supposed to be the leader necessarily yeah because everybody's you know you have type a and type b personalities and yeah 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 that's, I'm, I'm pretty b i just i like to play man that's <laughs> largely are we playing i'm on board <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 
cool. cool. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, this is yeah. fun. Uh, it's been awesome. I'd love up. to come on again with other stuff that I can speak to. I'm listening to some of these things when you're talking about like synth pedals and other like techniques. I was like, well, this is this is out of my this is beyond my domain. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's why we got to bring in the right person for each yeah. topic. Yeah, that's right. We're so, right. as we always say to our uh, our listeners, if you do have a a deep knowledge of a specific subject area, um, feel free to. Yep. contact us and maybe we can have you on the show yep or know somebody who does yeah mm -hmm. these are two Absolutely. really easy guys to talk to <laughs> yeah we just we just want to have a good conversation and talk about the things that we enjoy and that we hope that you enjoy yeah and that's anything related to music really yeah and yeah. learn something along the way that's mm -hmm. that's that's kind of what it's what it's all about is expanding our musical language each and every single one of us whether you play drums guitar vocals piano bass anything doesn't matter just uh, that language that we all speak and, and, and diving a little bit more into it and getting more knowledge so so that we can all together speak a little bit more clearly it's it's, it's kind of cool yeah is there uh any place that uh our listeners can go to find more about you do you have oh. any online presence any of let's see um one of the bands if you search uh broken ground band.com that's my 90s early 2000s like blink 22 foo fighter z uh, cover band okay. half harry.com is the tiny band um that's uh which just you gotta listen because people uh, they see two ukuleles a saxophone and a small kid and give like the most confused looks and i'm like just close your eyes and listen to a song and then then judge <laughs> right right <laughs> um those would be the two spots i don't have my own website i don't I mean, I've, I have apparently managed to fill up my schedule pretty much completely just from teaching and then the gigs with those two bands. Uh, FarawaySongs.com, that's the duo that I play drums with. They're, they play all the time, all over the place, and then sometimes I have drums with them. Cool. Very cool. And you can check out uh, Sean's drumming out with the Kairos Quintet. Yes. Well. Yeah. Cool. All right, guys. Well, thank you very much. This was a good reunion. Yes, it yeah. was. By all means, everybody have yourselves a good day, whatever you're doing, whether you're listening in the car or mowing some lawn or doing some chores. Thank you for tuning in to Fret Buzz, the podcast. And we shall catch you next Thursday, same bat time, same bat channel. Bat channel. Yeah, before your time. <laughs> it's a Batman reference. Yes, it's a Batman reference. It kind of came out of nowhere there. All right, guys, I gotta go. All right. <laughs> See. Adios. Yeah.